Hello comic book guys and gals and welcome to Comic Mag Musings. I'm your host, Bill Miller. In this recording I thought I'd do something a little bit different. Every now and then, when I'm working, I would like to have something comic book related playing without the need or commitment of visually focusing upon whatever video it happens to be. That way I can have a playing in the background, I can work, and when I want to pay attention to it, I can. But I don't necessarily have to focus on it, and I certainly don't have to commit my vision to the video. And so I figured there might be some other people looking for the same type of thing. ETA Nick has a has an investment chat where it covers the stock market and how that relates to the comic book market. And sometimes he'll release that as a live chat and then subsequently as a vlog or a recording. And that seems to fit the bill just fine for what I'm looking for. So I'm hopeful that this can serve in that same regard for some others who might be looking for similar content. So this will be the first in what I hope to be a series of vlogs, that's the vlog, where it's just the recording. You can go about working or doing chores or whatever you need to do and focus on it when you want to, but otherwise it's playing in the background and there's no sense of obligation to look at me showing something or doing something in particular on the video. I'm going to read a comic book issue. <laughs> so what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with Fantastic Four number one. Right now, uh, many musings and I, we read to one another prior to bedtime. He's reading out of the Showcase Presents trade paperback Volume 1 for Green Lantern. And I'm reading out of the Marvel Essential trade paperback, Volume 2 for the Fantastic Four. And I'll probably use trades just because, you know, obviously a lot of the earlier issues I don't have as floppies. And if I did have them, I'd probably feel a little bit better about reading out of a black and white trade that didn't cost a whole lot of money. So I will take suggestions. Uh, if someone wants something uh, to be in a future recording, and I have it, I'll certainly do that. I do have a lot of trade paperbacks. I certainly don't have everything, but I do have a lot of them. And so whether it's Marvel, DC, or Indie, there's a possibility I might have something. And if so, then I'll queue it up for a future recording. Let me know if you like it. If you do, I'll try to do more of these. If you don't, that's fine too. I'll put my time elsewhere into making videos that, that people do seem to enjoy. So without further ado, we're going to read issue number one of the Fantastic Four. So we start out with that iconic cover. There's a creature that bursts through the street, and in his right paw or hand, he's holding the invisible girl. Directly in front of him, preoccupied by being wrapped up, is Mr. Fantastic. And directly in front of the creature, slightly to the right of, his, of him, is the thing and the human torch is swooping in from a top just in front of his head so here we go the fantastic four here they are dr reed richards ben grimm susan storm johnny storm with the sudden fury of a thunderbolt a flare is shot into the sky over central city Three awesome words take form as if by magic, and a legend is born. We have three police officers looking around, talking to one another. Look, in the sky, what in blazes does it mean? 
I don't know, but the crowds are getting panicky. Rumors are flying about an alien invasion. Above all the hubbub and excitement, one strange figure holds a still smoking flare gun. One strange man who is somehow more than just a man, for he is the leader of the Fantastic Four. And we see a shot of Reed Richards holding a flare gun through a window of a brick building. It is the first time I have found it necessary to give the signal. I pray it will be the last. And now we see the invisible girl with a friend of hers inside of a room. In another part of town, Susan Storm is having tea with a society friend when she hears the ominous words. Susan, look, those words in the sky, what do they mean? So it has happened at last. I must be true to my vow. There can be no turning back. It is time for the world to meet the invisible girl. Susan, she, she's gone, but where, how? And Susan turns invisible and leaves her friend perplexed. And just outside of a brick building, we see her still invisible moving through a crowd. Hey, what's going on? Some Something rushed past me. Something unseen. Stand aside. I have no time to lose. It It's a ghost. Just what I need. An empty cab. And the cab driver says, Boy, what a dull day. I might as well cruise around until I pick up a fare. So the invisible girl got in the cab, unbeknownst to the driver. Thank you, I will get out here. Okay. Huh? Wait. Who said that? What? There's a floating bit of currency right in front of him. Don't just sit there gaping, man. Take your money. Uh, I'm seeing things. Hearing things. Or, or not seeing them. Gangway, I'm getting out of here. He leaves in a dust of fury. It works. I really am invisible. Completely, totally invisible. There can be no doubt. Now all that remains is my mission. But let us leave the amazing invisible girl and turn our attention to a men's clothing store in another part of town. So we see a gentleman in a hat, glasses, and a big trench coat. I'm sorry, mister. I just don't carry anything big enough to fit a man your size. Ah, everywhere it is the same. I live in a world too small for me. Look, out in the window in the sky. Those words, the Fantastic Four, what can they mean? So, the time has come. Wait, don't bother taking off your coat. I told you we have anything in your size. Your, your size, oh no. And the man faints. What a relief to get rid of those tight rags. As we see the thing. Exiting through the wall of the building. Why must they build doorways so narrow? Holy smoke, a, a monster. And then we see the police on the scene. Pete, look, what's that? I don't know, but I ain't taking any chances with it. Halt, halt or I'll shoot. Okay, I warned you. He shoots at the thing. The thing is unaffected, but he picks up a manhole cover from the street. His first shot missed because he was so nervous, but he'll not get another chance. Did you see that? He ripped the manhole cover out of the ground with his bare hands. It's impossible. And the thing drops down into the sewer. I have gone far enough. I should be under my destination by now. But there is no manhole above me. No opening. Bah! I cannot delay. I'll make an opening. And he bursts through the street. And as he comes up through the street, a car runs right into him, and the front end of the car is smashed. What is that? Right in front of me. Oh, no, it's alive. Fool, did you not see me in time? It's a walking nightmare. Help, help. And the car occupants of the car... Take off in a dash. Lily-livered cowards. It ain't human. It's too big, too strong. It, it's a Martian. Minutes later, the police riot squad reaches the scene. There's no one here. Street's deserted. Then who put in that danger call? I don't know how to explain it, but there's something weird happening in Central City. Those words in the sky, those scattered reports of monsters walking the streets. But what is that up to, Chief? What? What does it add up to indeed? Perhaps if the police officers could witness still another scene in a local service station, they would find yet another clue, as will we. We got a parent gentle as a lamb, Johnny. Good, that's the way I like her. There's only one thing in the world that interests me more than cars. Yeah, what's that, Johnny? 
hey, Johnny, look, in the sky, those words, they're all coming together. They're turning into a number, the number four. As they both look up and see the number four in the sky. Johnny, that heat, where's it coming from? What, what's happening to you? Don't worry, pal. You're turning into a, a human torch. Remember me saying there's only one thing I care about more than cars? Well, this is it. And Johnny Storm flames on and takes off from the car. Impossible, incredible, call it what you will, but the figure which had been Johnny Storm scant seconds before is now a careening human torch flashing through the skies above like a flaming meteor. Look, a blazing com burning comet. No, it's not a comet. It's, it's, unless we're going mad, it's something human. Seconds later, the mayor of Central City issues an emergency order. Call the governor. Have him alert the National Guard. Move, man. Y yes, sir. And before the hour is out, Washington has also taken immediate action. Rag dog to squadron leader. Attack unknown flaming object over Central City. And we see some pilots in military jets. Flaming object, huh? Someone must have flipped his lid. Of all the wild goose to... Hey, wait. What's that? It is a flaming flying object. Let's get it, guys. No, no, stay back. Keep away. Why won't they listen? I warned them I tried not to burn their planes, but they came too close. At least they all parachuted to safety. That sound in the distance, it looks like a hunter missile. It's zeroed in on me. It's attracted to my flame. I can't escape it. It's too fast. It has a nuclear warhead. If it explodes, I'm a goner. Suddenly, the human torch's flame begins to diminish, and as the missile is about to strike him, two impossibly long arms reach above the rooftops and... Got it. Moving with dazzling speed, one of the incredible arms hurls the mighty missile far from shore where it explodes harmlessly over the sea. And that is Mr. Fantastic that grabs the missile and hurls it away. But as the flying boy's flame flickers out altogether, he begins to plummet toward Earth, toward a certain doom. Grab me, Johnny boy. That's it. And he's saved at the last minute by Mr. Fantastic, who stretches his body between the two buildings. Who is this unbelievable stranger who has saved the human torch? You're safe now, lad. You're safe. In fact, who are all four of these strange and astonishing humans? How did they become what they are? What mystic quirk of fate brought them together to form the awe-inspiring group known as the Fantastic Four? You all heeded my summons. Good. There is a task that awaits us, a fearful task. But there is time enough to learn of that task which faces the Fantastic Four. First, let us discover more about their origin. Let us go back to that momentous day when an angry Ben Grimm confronted Dr. Reed Richards. If you want to fly up to the stars, then you pilot the ship. Count me out. You know we haven't done enough research into the effect of cosmic rays. They might kill us out all out in space. Ben, we've got to take that chance, unless we want the commies to beat us, beat us to it. I, I never thought that you would be a coward. A coward? Nobody calls me a coward. Get the ship. I'll fly her no matter what happens. And so, led by a determined Dr. Reed Richards, the little group sped toward the spaceport on the outskirts of town. Susan, Ben, and I know what we're doing, but you and Johnny... Don't say it, Reed. I'm your fiancé. Where you go, I go. And I'm tagging along with Sis, so it's settled. No time to wait for official clearance. Conditions are right. Tonight, let's go. They're sneaking on to the launch pad. Before the guard can stop them, the mighty ship which Reed Richards had spent years constructing is soaring into the heavens, towards outer space. She's behaving like a baby. Everything is perfect as they're rocketing away. Yeah, except the cosmic rays. No one knows what they'll do. Higher and higher, like a silver bullet, roars the sleek spacecraft. We had to do it. We had to be the first. But we're reaching the cosmic storm area. Hang on. Rack, tick, 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 tick. Hear that? It's the cosmic rays. I, I warned you about them. They're penetrating the ship. Our shielding isn't strong enough. But I don't feel anything. Naturally, they're only rays of light. You can't feel them, but they'll affect you just the same. My head, it, 
It's pounding as though it's about to burst. Ben was right. We should have waited. Should have gotten heavier shielding. Johnny, what is it? What's happening to you? They're being bounced around the ship, and Johnny's starting to smoke. I, I don't know, sis. My body feels hot, like it's on fire. I, I feel like I'm burning up. Ugh, listen to me. Somebody else take the controls. I can't handle the ship anymore. My, my arms are heavy. Too heavy, can't move. Too heavy, got to lie down, can't move. Ben! As Ben slumps to the floor of the rocket. At that moment, the powerful ship's automatic pilot took over and managed to return the sleek rocket safely to Earth in a rough but non-fatal landing. They all cleared themselves of the debris and wreckage. I I'm grateful we're all alive. It was mighty close. But Reed, we failed. After all your work, your dedication, we failed. Ah, what'd you expect? But we're still not completely safe. We still have to see whether the cosmic rays affected us in any way. Oh, Reed, I feel so strange. Susan. Look at Susan. What's wrong? You're <gasps> fading away. Oh, no, no. It's impossible. Somehow the cosmic rays have altered your atomic structure, making you grow invisible. Sis, I can't see you at all anymore. How, how long will it last? There's no way of knowing. What, what if she never gets visible again? Look, I see her. I'm myself again. It happened so suddenly, all by itself. Thank heavens you're all right, my darling. All right, eh? How do you know, wise guy? How do you know she won't turn invisible again? How do you know what'll happen to the rest of us? Ben, I'm sick and tired of your insults, of your complaining. I didn't purposely cause our flight to fail. And I'm sick of you, period. In fact, I'm going to paste you right in that smug face of yours. Ben, stop. Wait. Look what's happening to you. You're, you're changing. Don't try to talk your way out of it, mister. I'm going to mop up the place with you. Run, Reed, darling. He's turned into a, a some sort of a thing. He's strong as an ox. Reed, darling, uh, how can you care for that weakling when I'm here? I'll prove to you that you love the wrong man, Susan. I'll... Hey, what? No, you don't. So the thing has pulled up a tree and swung at Reed, whose rubbery body has managed to contort itself to miss the impact. You've had this coming to you for a long time, Ben. Oh, Reed, Reed, not you, too. Not you, too. What am I doing? What happened to me? To all of us? And Reed has wrapped his long arms around the thing many times. You've turned into monsters, both of you. It's those rays, those terrible cosmic rays. This is Johnny. And don't ask me why he has a southern accent and the others don't. <laughs> We need to distinguish the characters. Now I know why I've been feeling so warm. Look at me. They've affected me too. When I get excited, I can feel my body begin to blaze. And he lights up into the torch. I'm lighter than air. I can fly. Look, I can fly. Minutes later, Johnny Storm's flames subsided, and he landed near the other three. Silently, they watched the small fire he had started in the underbrush burn itself out. Silently, they were each occupied with their own startling thoughts. And they all think simultaneously, we've changed, all of us. We're more than just human. Listen to me, all of you. That means you too, Ben. Together we have more power than any humans have ever possessed. You don't have to make a speech, Big Shot. We understand. we got to use that power to help mankind, right? Right, Ben. Right. I'm calling myself the Human Torch, and I'm with you all the way. Same goes for me, the Invisible Girl. There's only one still missing. Ben? I ain't Ben anymore. I'm what Susan called me. The Thing. And I'll call myself Mr. Fantastic. And so was born the Fantastic Four. And from that moment on, the world would never again be the same. That's the end of the first story. And now we begin the next story in this issue. The Fantastic Four meet the Mole Man. And now, having met our four amazing characters, let us resume our tale. I called you together because I have some pictures to show you. Pictures? What are they, pinups? Look, all of you, this used to be an atomic plant behind the Iron Curtain. Wow, what happened to it? The same thing that happened to the other atomic plants on, on those photos. This one is in Australia. And this is in South America. 
That's just it. It's happening to atomic plants all over the world. No one knows how or why. Wait. According to the steady impulses on my radar machine, another cave-in is about due to take place. And even as Reed Richards speaks halfway around the world in French Africa, the following scene is taking place. What is wrong, Pierre? I do not know. It sounds insane. But the sand beneath my feet seems to be throbbing. Almost as if something is moving below us. Almost as if... Listen. Don't you feel it? Help! It is an earthquake, but here in the desert, impossible. Impossible or not, Pierre almost fell to his doom. Wait, the ground is trembling again. What can it be? Sacre bleu! The earth is going mad. The entire installation, it... It is caving in. When we see the military slash atomic installation being sucked into a chasm or hole in the ground. But the worst is yet to come. For less than 30 seconds later, In the name of heaven, what is that? What indeed? It is a gigantic pair of claws, the likes of which have never been seen on Earth or on any planet in the universe. It is unbelievable, mind-staggering, but real. Artillery! Bring the artillery! Hurry! Hurry! Artillery. Of what use is artillery against a creature whose hide is powerful enough to dig its way up through countless tons of rock-hard earth? Artillery. Of what use is artillery against a monster who can crush a heavy tank with one hand? And so this is the monster that we see on the cover of this issue. And he comes up out of the ground, and he grabs a tank and smashes it like a tinker toy. But just as it seems that nothing in the world will halt the nightmare menace, the shrill sound of a commanding voice is heard, and the Goliath stops in its tracks. Enough! Return to Earth's core! Our mission here is finished! Go! For even such a monster needs its master, a master known as the Mole Man. But we shall return to the Mole Man before long. First, let us turn our attention back to the Fantastic Four as they gaze in astonishment at Dr. Reed Richards' super-sensitive radar scope. There, it has happened again, this time in French Equatorial Africa. But how? Why? That's what we've got to find out. By studying the cave-ins carefully, I've pinpointed an island located exactly between them. That is where we will find our answer. It is known as Monster Isle. Monster Isle? That's just a fairy tale. There's no such place. Only one way to find out, then. And find out they do. Hours later, aboard their small private jet, the Fantastic Four see a strange mountain rising from the sea like an unearthly, grotesque face. They have found Monster Isle. There it is. Little dreaming what awaits them, they climb to the top of the forbidding peak. If this is just a wild goose chase, mister, I'll make sure you live to regret it. Save your breath for the climb, gruesome. Hold it, I hear something. It's coming from below. Look, those eyes. Suddenly... A living three-headed nightmare hurls itself at them from over the edge of the peak of Monster Isle. And we see coming up over the peak of the, actually over the plateau, a three-headed dinosaur-looking type monster. Quick, Sue, turn invisible. Seeing one of its intended victims vanish before its eyes, the monster halts, bewildered. There, just time for me to become Mr. Fantastic again. I'll make a huge lasso out of my arm. Got him. So this creature has wings, and it was starting to fly away. Mr. Fantastic roped him around the neck. I had heard there was a giant three-headed creature guarding this isle, but he shall guard it no longer. And then the creature is thrown into the sea. But before Mr. Fantastic and the Human Torch can catch their breath, look out. It's a cave-in. They fall through a hole in that cliff. Hold on, Johnny, hold on. Lucky Sue and Ben weren't with us at the edge. So Mr. Fantastic made a parachute out of his body, which Johnny is using to alight down to the ground. Finally, the amazing duo float down to the bottom of the pit. It's pitch dark. What sort of place can it be? Reed, I feel something. It's a trap door on the wall. It's moving. That light, where did it come from? It's blinding, I can't see, I'm I'm blacking out. It might be minutes or hours later when the two men regain their senses only to find themselves garbed in strange adhesive-type suits 
which protect them from the blinding unearthly glow. My head, the light, it actually caused us to lose consciousness, but how did we get into these suits? So, you have recovered, have you? It is about time. Who, who are you? I can't see. And where are we? The reason you cannot see is you are blinded by the glare from the Valley of Diamonds. And as for me, I am the Mole Man. And for the first time, we see a close-up shot of the Mole Man. And then the next section of the story is the Mole Man's Secret. Before we witness the breathtaking conclusion of our amazing tale, let us gather together all the loose ends. Let us return to the two members of the Fantastic Four who did not fall below during the cave-in. Reed and Johnny got to find them. Wait, that noise behind me. What? But other ears also hear the menacing sounds, and other eyes behold the frightening sight. The eyes of the thing. So there's a creature that's crested the edge of this little hill who's facing the back of Invisible Girl. Duck, Sue, out of the way. Let me handle him. The second gigantic guardian of Monster Isle is a is powerful beyond belief. But he is fighting an enemy whose every atom has been charged with cosmic rays, an enemy who can't be stopped. You've done it, Ben. You've beaten him. What did you expect? I'm the thing, ain't I? And he picks him up and hurls him into the water. Now, let's go and find that skinny, loudmouth boyfriend of yours. Oh, Ben, if only you could stop hating Reed for what happened to you. And what of Reed Richards and Sue's brother Johnny? We again descend to the depths of Monster Isle, where we find them confronted by the strangest menace of all time, the Mole Man. So, you have never before heard of the Mole Man, eh? Well, soon the world shall hear of me. For soon the Mole Man will have the entire world in his power. How did you get here? What is this place? It all started long ago, because the people of the surface world mocked me. What? Me? Go out with you? Don't make me laugh. I know you're qualified, but you can't work here. You'd scare our other employees away. Hey, is that your face or are you wearing a mask? Ha ha ha. Finally, I could stand it no longer. I decided to strike out alone to search for a new world, the legendary land at the center of the earth, a world where I could be king. My travels took me all over the globe. Even this loneliness is better than the cruelty of my fellow man. And then, just when I had almost abandoned hope, when my little skiff had been washed ashore here on Monster Isle, I found it. That strange cavern, where can it lead to? I soon saw where it led. It led to the land of my dreams. Down there, below, I found it. It's Earth's center. But in the dread silence of that huge cavern, the sudden shock of my loud outcry caused a violent avalanche, and when it was over, I had somehow miraculously survived the fall, but due to the impact of the crash, I had lost most of my sight. Yes, I had found the center of the Earth, but I was stranded here like a human mole. That was to be the last of my misfortunes. My luck began to turn to my favor. I mastered the creatures down here, made them do my bidding, and with their help I carved out an underground empire. A note of madness creeps into the mole's voice as he speaks of his power, and then he makes his first fatal mistake. I conquered everything about me. I even learned to sense things in the dark like a mole. Here, I'll show you. Try to strike me with that pole. Try it, I say. Ha! I sense that blow coming. Nothing can take me by surprise and I have developed other senses too, like those of the bat. I possess a natural radar sense, a warning system which enables me to evade whatever danger strikes at me. And as he's explaining this, one of the two captives, probably Johnny, is swinging a staff at him. Compared to the Mole Man, you are slow, clumsy, ha <laughs> ha. See how easily I defeat you, or any others who try to defy me, try to defy me? And he has his own staff with which he strikes, we'll say Johnny, and makes him tumble. Now, before I slay you all, behold my master plan. See this map of my underground empire. Each tunnel leads to a major city. As soon as I have wrecked every atomic plant, every source of earthly power, my mighty mole creatures will attack and destroy everything that lives above the surface. 
And now, at my signal, those creatures of darkness, my denizens of Earth's center, shall dispose of all of you witless, witless intruders. We'll see about that, Maul. The thing. Too late, fool. The die is cast. There is no turning back. Thing, look out behind you. Bong, bong. So obviously the invisible girl and the thing have tracked down their two teammates and the mole man. Hearing the mole's signal, the largest and most deadly of his underground creatures ponderously raises itself into the room, its brainless rage directed at the four astonished humans. And then the Fantastic Four fly into blazing action. Look out, Reed, I'm going to burn my way out of this monkey suit. Good boy, Torch. Stand aside, gang. It's going to get mighty warm around here. And so Johnny blazes on and takes off into the sky. And this is the creature from the cover that they are now fighting. Back and forth, buzzing around the monster's head like a hornet, flies the human torch as the gigantic creature vainly tries to grasp his fiery foe. Reed, the mole man, he's escaping. Not if I can help it, Sue. And help it, I can. So Reed stretches his arm out to grab the fleeing mole man. Moving like a well-oiled fighting machine, the Fantastic Four, with the deadly Mole Man in their grasp, race for the surface. But then their evil antagonist seizes the signal cord again and... You haven't won yet. Even you can't defeat all of my under-earth hordes. Hurry, Reed, hurry. Can't you even hold on to one little guy? And then they come, like figments of a mad nightmare. Roaring, running, snarling, the Mole Man's entire army of underground gargoyles. And we see a menagerie of uh, grotesqueries that are coming after them. But they hadn't counted on the unbelievable power of the Human Torch. Flying between his fantastic allies and the pursuing horde, he blazes a fiery swath which melts the soft earth. This will cause a rock slide sealing, off, sealing us off from those creatures. We did it! We're free! And the entrance to the Mole Man's empire is sealed forever. Moments later... As they take off in the jet. But where is the Mole Man? I left him behind. He'll never trouble anyone again. And the words of Mr. Fantastic are indeed prophetic. As seconds later, he's destroyed the entire isle. He's, he's sealed himself below forever. It's best that way. There was no place for him in our world. Perhaps he'll find peace down there. I hope so. I just hope we have seen the last of him. But, whether we've seen the last of the Mole Man or not, we will see much more of the most amazing quartet in history in the next great issue of The Fantastic Four. Don't miss it. And that is the end of The Fantastic Four, issue number one. I certainly hope you enjoyed it. If you did, I would encourage you to subscribe and hit that notification bell. That way you'll be alerted as soon as I release new recordings. Thumbs up and comments are always appreciated. And remember, we're taking over the world one comic book at a time.